mysterious messages. That is an ambigram. Secret cults. Deadly conspiracies. That's Illuminati. Brutal murders. And an epic battle between faith and reason. Our church is at war. Like the Da Vinci Code, Dan Brown's best-selling novel, Angels and Demons, ignites both controversy and outrage. The conspiracies that Dan deals with, the intensity of the ongoing curiosity, it's staggering. There wasn't a powerful organization on Earth they didn't penetrate. But how much of its story of secret societies and papal scandals is based on historical fact? A lot of the intrigue and the secrecy comes from the place where science and religion meet. And could the Vatican's centuries-old reluctance to embrace modern science really be a cover-up to one of the greatest and most profound mysteries in the universe? Who doesn't love a good conspiracy theory? It has to be here! Four cardinals were kidnapped from their quarters inside the Vatican sometime between 3 and 5 a.m. this morning. These criminals who sent this ambigram meant it as a taunt, a provocation. But Captain Olivetti think if you can use it to learn their identity, perhaps we can stop this abomination. Why me? Your expertise, your erudition, your recent involvement with certain church, shall we say, mysteries? Robert Langdon, academic, adventurer. As conceived in the mind of best-selling author Dan Brown, he's one of the smartest and most compelling heroes in modern literature and cinema. He's the world's only symbologist. The star on his skin? The pinnacle is a pagan religious icon. He's got to have a knowledge of history, architecture, art, math, religious faiths. So he is constantly making these connections the way puzzle masters do. This is the first marker. The path is alive. With the publication of The Da Vinci Code in 2003, the character of Robert Langdon quickly secured his place in popular culture as one of the greatest fictional investigators since Sherlock Holmes. We've been dragged into a world of people who think this stuff is real. Real enough to kill for. <laughs> but, as depicted in both The Da Vinci Code and Angels and Demons, Langdon's exploits also added fuel to an already heated debate about the nature of religion, the foundations of faith, and even the very existence of God. What Dan Brown does is he blends history with these conspiracy theories that he's read about. He rarely invents one, you know, he extrapolates from. Collisions are fixed and running. And then he blends his imagination and builds these incredibly imaginative thrillers. The story of Angels and Demons involves the theft of one of the most lethally explosive devices ever created capable of delivering the equivalent of a five kiloton atomic blast. The device will annihilate not only a conclave of cardinals gathered to elect the next pope, but Vatican City. The Catholic Church, as we know it, could be destroyed. As Dan Brown suggested in Angels and Demons, there are dark forces trying to destroy the Catholic Church. Um, and, you know, one wonders who, who are these dark forces exactly? In appreciating the fact that Dan Brown can very successfully weave together facts that people know to be true and fiction for the sake of drama is impressive, but it also puts me in the position where people are asking questions about, wow, is that really true? I'm sure that the church itself would say yes. Dark forces are always trying to attack Christianity, that Satan is always trying to and oppose Christ. In Angels and Demons, the first key to decoding the motivations behind the Vatican plot lies with a mysterious killer who, after setting the explosive, kidnaps four prominent cardinals and prepares them for ritual sacrifice. According to the novel, 
The killer is a direct descendant of a real-life 11th century Persian group known as the Hashashin. These hired killers flourished during the Christian Crusades and gave birth to the modern-day term, assassin. According to legend, the members of the group carried out their assignments while under the influence of hashish, thus giving them their name, Hashashin. The assassin, the Hashashin, are mercenaries. Basically, you would hire them out, and they were very effective killers, and they would go do basically your dirty work for you. The assassins were a militaristic sect whose job was to kill other varieties of Muslims who they believed were heretics. Very often, an assassin killer would be put into the courts of a Muslim ruler, and he'd be there as a sort of sleeper. And he could be there for many years, working his way up in, in positions of authority. And so one day he received a message saying, kill your ruler. And he would do just that. He would kill him with a sword, usually publicly, very often in a mosque. And the idea was to make it a public spectacle and to bring fear, to bring horror, into the hearts and minds of the people who the assassins were opposed to. In Angels and Demons, the assassins' gruesome work isn't done in a mosque, but in churches throughout Rome. But it's the Vatican itself that's ultimately the target of a unique time bomb stolen from a secret laboratory known as CERN. That canister contains an extremely combustible substance called antimatter. The antimatter is suspended there in an airtight nanocomposite shell with electromagnets on each end. But if it were to fall out of suspension and come in contact with matter, say the bottom of the canister, then the two opposing forces would annihilate one another violently. And what might cause it to fall out of suspension? The battery going dead, which it will just before midnight. Vatican City will be consumed by light. But just what is CERN? Established in 1954 by a coalition of 12 West European countries, CERN actually exists as a physics laboratory and research center located near Geneva, Switzerland. Its early years were devoted to atomic research, but the organization gained what is perhaps its greatest fame in the early 1990s when scientists Tim Berners-Lee and Robert Caillot invented a little something called the World Wide Web. In recent years, CERN has caused quite a stir within the scientific community by attempting to harness and study one of the most elusive and most volatile elements in the known universe, antimatter. We are made of matter. Matter is made of small particles. They have fancy names like electron, proton. Now, antimatter is in some sense the mirror image of that matter. So proton has a positive charge, Antiproton has a negative charge. Antimatter is actually very familiar. Uh, it sounds like this weird science fiction thing, but actually it's very commonly used uh, in, in hospitals for diagnosis of cancer and things like that. And there you have a modest amount of positrons, which then interact with the electrons, their opposite twins, in the body. And that produces high energy light rays, which then you can image using various detectors. The resulting burst of light, when the positive charge meets the negative, means that the matter and antimatter have completely destroyed each other during contact. In the scientific world, that process is called annihilation. You can also use the word destruction, but annihilation has the aspect that afterwards, nothing material is left, it's all gone in radiation. Because antimatter does not naturally exist in our world, the only way to study it is to make it. Inside CERN, there is a machine called Alpha, dedicated to producing one specific form of antimatter, anti-hydrogen. But there are two sides to this device, essentially. This part of the device mostly has to do with antiprotons on the left side of this apparatus here. This is a source for positrons. We then put it all together in this device. Antiprotons and positrons are mixed and make the anti-hydrogen. We store antimatter just like it's described in the book. We're using um, electric fields and magnetic fields to keep the charged antiparticles away from um, matter. 
so they are suspended, so they cannot annihilate and disappear. In Angels and Demons, the assassin steals a canister which contains antimatter. But could even a small amount of antimatter really destroy something as large as Vatican City? The interesting thing about an antimatter explosion is the products you get are very different than a normal explosion. If I think of a normal explosion, what's happening is the matter that's compressed together in the object, say the dynamite or the TNT, is literally flying apart. And it's heating the air, and the air is moving away at a very high speed. So you get a shock wave, and then the shock wave maybe hits the building. In a matter-antimatter collision, the first thing that happens is the matter and antimatter completely annihilate. And what we mean by annihilate is turn into energy. All you get out are x-rays. Where does this become dangerous? The x-rays can actually heat the air, and now you start having the same effects you would have in a chemical explosion. You get very, very hot air. It expands quickly. You get some sort of shock wave. Maybe that knocks down the building. It's not the goal of CERN to produce weapons. Over the last 20 years, when you sum it all up, we have produced something like 10 billionths of a gram of antimatter. That's about the energy of a firecracker. It's only when you have huge amounts, like a gram or something like that, antimatter, that would be dangerous. Then I would not sit in this room. In Dan Brown's Angels and Demons, technology is pitted against the church in a deadly showdown involving mysterious clues, secret cults, and a frantic race against the clock. Hey! But just how serious is the real life struggle between science and faith? And could it really lead to conspiracy, violence, and murder? We must evacuate Vatican City. Oh, that is exactly what they want. Publicity and panic. No, we must not give them oxygen for the media fire. But the people in St. Peter's Square care deeply about their church, as we do. Their faith will sustain them. Their faith will not protect them from an explosion. We are all bound for heaven eventually, are we not? In Angels and Demons, the deadly antimatter bomb is set to destroy not only Vatican City, but also 200 cardinals who are locked behind closed doors while taking part in one of the most mysterious and secretive rituals in Catholicism, a conclave. Conclave is a period of time after the Pope's death where they select among the cardinals a new Pope. And the cardinals are locked for hours and hours at a time into the Sistine Chapel. No cameras, no outsiders, no recording devices. No one really knows what goes on there. They've been put under conclave, that is to say, under lock and key, so they don't take forever to do it. And uh, for about the past uh, four or 500 years, supposedly the cardinals are to keep secret what goes on in the conclave. Originally, the conclave had to have sort of great secrecy about it because there were lots of influences, of people trying to buy off the elections, rich Roman families, uh, emperors wanting to determine a veto vote, and so on. So what exactly does go on behind those closed doors? They say that the conclave is one of the last sort of political events where you don't have voter fraud, because you get one cardinal, one vote, he's got to hand write it and take it up to the altar and say, a prayer in front of Michelangelo's last judgment that he freely chooses this person for pope. And then he puts it into the chalice, and he's watched by the three scrutineers who then have to take it out and count it. So they've got all of the ballots accounted for. And it is a very strict system of voting with no chance for any kind of outside influence. The notion of locking the cardinals into a space in order to deliberate and arrive at this all-important decision. It's not just about focusing their energies. It is about locking evil out. And it's an aspect of our story, Angels and Demons, because here at this moment when they're trying to make this crucial decision, evil, in fact, 
permeates the Vatican. In Angels and Demons, the conclave is called when it appears that the Pope has died under mysterious circumstances. If the Holy Father was murdered, the implications are profound. Vatican security is impenetrable. No one from the outside could have got anywhere near him. He was someone on the inside, and we can trust no one. But while the assassination of the Pope in this story may be fictional, mysterious deaths at the Vatican do have a basis in historical fact. Obviously, the Pope is a figure that many people might have an interest in attacking. Madmen or people who are politically or ide ideologically opposed to the Pope for some reason might have a motive, just as they would for a head of state in a political sense. There's the same danger surrounding the Pope. In the nearly 2,000 year history of the Catholic Church, a number of popes have met violent or mysterious ends. Many of the early popes were martyred. In the year 903, Pope Leo V was allegedly strangled. And in 1047, Pope Clement II was poisoned by sugar laced with lead. You had plenty of periods where popes were poisoned or uh, potential popes were taken out before they could be elected, and certainly um, cardinals were paid off in order to elect uh, the son of a wealthy family or in order to elect the person um, that the emperor wanted elected. But perhaps no papal death has gained more notoriety and been shrouded in more mystery than the sudden passing of Pope John Paul I. Elected in August of 1978, he died just 33 days later. The official version, of course, because they couldn't say at that time that a nun had found him dead, was that he had been found dead by his private secretary. Nonetheless, the suspicions and the rumors started that he had been poisoned. Now, why might he have been poisoned? Uh, one theory was that he was trying to get rid of the Masonic influences in the Vatican and indeed had a list of Masonic members who were priests in the Vatican. And it was said that with the influence of Masons in the Vatican, they poisoned him. The Vatican obviously uh, concluded that it was a heart attack, and that's it. It will forever remain a mystery, like many things in the Vatican, because they themselves conduct the investigation, and so you don't have access to whatever the investigators discovered, and everything else is just rumor. <laughs> On May 13, 1981, the succeeding pope, John Paul II, was shot and wounded in St. Peter's Square by a Turkish assassin named Mehmet Ali Aja. The event shocked the world and caused the Vatican to reevaluate its security measures. In the wake of the assassination attempt on John Paul II, security measures around the Vatican have been dramatically increased. The Pope Mobile that John Paul II used to drive around in, well, that was after he was shot in St. Peter's Square. And those glass windows are meant to protect the Pope from bullets. And after 9-11, they installed metal detectors in St. Peter's Square so that anyone going into the Basilica would be searched. Ernesto Olivetti, Inspector General of the Vatican Police Force. My pleasure. This way, please. We'll meet in the headquarters of the Swiss Guard. I thought you were Swiss Guard. No, uh, La Gendarmeria, we are responsible for everything inside the Vatican walls, with the exception of the security of uh, His Holiness yeah. and the Apostolic Palace. That is Swiss Guard. Vatican City is a sovereign city-state sitting on 110 acres inside the center of Rome, home to a population of 900. It is the smallest country in the world and for centuries has been guarded by two independent security forces. The first, called the Gendarmerie Corps, 
or Vatican Police, is responsible for border control, traffic regulation, and criminal investigation. The second is an elite force called the Swiss Guard. Trained in Switzerland since the 15th century, they serve as the Pope's personal bodyguards. But there is another duty shared by the papal security forces, and that is to make sure that what happens inside the walls of the Vatican stays there. The results of any investigations in the Vatican are always kept private. So for example, in 1998, with the murder of the commander-in-chief of the Swiss Guards, his wife, and possible suicide of the corporal that supposedly killed him, the killings happened at about 9 in the evening. And the next morning, we already had declaration from the Vatican as to how the event unfolded and the motivation for it. The complaint, of course, was that that really wasn't enough time to do a thorough investigation. But the Vatican is always very attentive to keep things as private as possible. And I think the reason is that they are legally a country and they have a right to conduct their investigations without interference. In Angels and Demons, the Vatican's struggle to maintain privacy, independence, and influence pushes the Roman Catholic Church into the crosshairs of a terrorist attack. We must defend ourselves. And with the world watching, vital questions are raised. Just who are the church's real friends? Who are its enemies? And just when did the struggle between science and faith begin? Our church is at war. We are under attack from an old enemy. They have struck us from within and threatening us all with destruction at the hands of their new god, science. In both the novel and the film versions of Angels and Demons, members of a secret cult of scientists and intellectuals are thought to be waging a deadly conspiracy against the Roman Catholic Church. The attack is motivated by revenge, presumably for the Church's history of intolerance, largely directed towards those who dare question religious faith. Angels and Demons takes place entirely in the present, and we, we certainly reference the past and there are echoes of the past that are influencing this crisis today. It's another one of the interesting aspects of the story. The intensity of the ongoing pressure between science and religion. In the case of Angels and Demons, it's these two giant subjects crashing into each other, uh, which is science and religion. Which one is right? But just when did this conflict between religion and science begin? And are the wounds so deep they could lead to the type of diabolical plot described in Dan Brown's story? In the mid-1500s, in response to what many thought was an attack on religion during the various Protestant reformations, the Roman Catholic Church tightened its grip on the faithful in the form of a series of inquisitions or tribunals. It was hoped that these investigative bodies, largely comprised of priests and clerics, would stamp out heresy and thus ensure God's souls would be saved. Although not all of these tribunals were under the jurisdiction of the Vatican, the period of the Inquisition was often tainted by corruption and hypocrisy and stained by torture and bloodshed. If you were known to speak out against the church, uh, a number of things could happen to you. If you were lucky, you would be hanged. They weren't too fond of that because it was too swift. So burning was the option, sometimes slow burning. Sometimes they would burn you deliberately, very slowly, and then pull you off the pyre for half an hour or so, and then put you back on. So that's the kind of thing you could expect. Of course, notions of sedition, heresy, and speaking out against the church could be widely interpreted and arbitrarily defined. To some, it meant any challenge posed to the word of God as set forth in the Bible. Anything other than a literal interpretation could mean imprisonment or death. 
And during the 17th century, the biggest threats posed to the church and its teachings would often be found in the world of science. We can look back for centuries and see the ways in which the church has officially taught that our faith is not exclusive of reason or even empirical science, that we need both of these things. We need ways in which we can measure knowledge. But there certainly are obvious examples of times when the Catholic Church has collided with science, Galileo being a good example. Galileo Galilei, a pioneering Italian physicist, mathematician, astronomer, and philosopher. He is known as the father of modern science. Born in 1564, he abandoned a career in the priesthood to pursue the study of science. In 1609, after having made significant contributions to the development of the compass and the thermometer, Galileo made refinements to a new invention called the telescope. Increasing its magnification capabilities from three to nearly 30 times. Inspired by the writings of Nicholas Copernicus, he soon turned his gaze toward the stars and came upon evidence that threatened one of the cherished teachings of the church. He gets credited with being the first one not only to start to look at the universe and to suggest this notion that the sun didn't move around the earth, he suggested the earth moved around the sun. And this was just anathema. This was complete heresy to the church. But the idea that the Earth revolved around the Sun had been around for at least a century from the time of Copernicus. And Copernicus himself was a Polish cleric who dedicated his book to the Pope. So it wasn't as if the church was somehow dead set against this idea. The problem the church had with Galileo was essentially that he used a new uh, technology, a, a rival authority to explain the universe. Galileo stopped using just religion, and the Catholic Church didn't like this at all. It, in a sense, challenged the belief that the world is created, you know, by God in an orderly, hierarchical way, and that the Earth was at the center and the human was at the center of the Earth. So it was a geocentric universe, and that made sense to the medieval person. In opposition to geocentric theory, Galileo's concept was referred to as heliocentric, deriving its name from the Greek god of the sun, Helios. The Galileo case was very complicated because of the state of Christianity at the time. It occurred during the Counter-Reformation when the church was very concerned about Protestant heresies. And unfortunately, there were holes in Galileo's presentation of his heliocentric system that made it possible for other scientists to offer compelling critiques. I think that people feel they are familiar with Galileo. We all have sort of like a grade school understanding of what went down there. We don't understand why it's important. You've got science versus faith. That is a foundation for a, a theme that will be constantly argued throughout the course of Angels and Demons. They call it retribution. They, they think it justified because of the church's attacks on men of science in the distant past, and it's true. Since the days of Galileo, this church has tried to slow the relentless march of progress, sometimes with misguided means. In 1616, the church issued a decree prohibiting Galileo from any further discussion or teaching of his radical astronomical theories. And during the era of the Inquisition, continuing to pursue those studies would threaten not only his career, but his life. Certainly in the Middle Ages and Renaissance, it was difficult for any scientist or artist to operate in complete freedom because they were completely dependent on the patronage of the Pope. So they were paid by the church. So if as a scientist then you came up with a conclusion that might not be so pleasing to the church or might not agree with that theology, you would probably have to try and make it palatable in some way if you didn't want to be killed. In the 17th century, if you were found to be thinking outside the restrictions, then the Inquisition could call you in and one had the opportunity to recant, but if one stubbornly held on to your own views, 
then there could be a very, very serious punishment by means of imprisonment or, in the worst case scenario, the burning alive within Campo di Fiori. And so it happened during Galileo's lifetime, he was aware of it. But Galileo was so convinced that what he said was in consonance with the faith that reasonable people would agree with him. And this is where, in, in the end, he goes wrong. In 1623, the church christened a new pope, Urban VIII. In earlier years, he had been both a friend and supporter of Galileo. Encouraged by this change, the scientist began research that would lead to the publication of his most famous work, Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems. In 1632, Galileo made the mistake of publishing a treatise in which he put three characters into a dialogue. Unfortunately, the name he gave to the character who supported the Earth being in the center was Simplicicus. This was not exactly complimentary. And the Inquisition, pushed on by Urban VIII, brings him in. With the Inquisition, one cannot have a discussion and persuade the judges that you are right. Basically, the Inquisition has already found that you are guilty, and so Galileo is, after four hearings, given the opportunity to recant, and he does. And so he abjures his views regarding the Copernican system, and he publicly recants something that he had been speaking about for three decades. And so Galileo spent the rest of his life essentially under house arrest and trying to work between the science, his worldview, and the worldview that was offered to him by the church. He was under house arrest first and at Villa Medici here in Rome, and then in Arcetri, where he's able to continue his intellectual work and his correspondence and his publications. But at the same time, he was a sort of public figure still, and you had people making pilgrimages, as it were, to go and visit him. And so Galileo, following his trial, would not be propounding these views publicly, but behind closed doors, he could share these ideas more freely. Galileo died while still under house arrest on January 8, 1642, at the age of 77. But when the Grand Duke of Tuscany, Ferdinand II, offered to erect a monument over the grave of the great scientist, he was sternly rebuked by Pope Urban VIII. Still considered a heretic, Galileo was allowed only a modest burial under the bell tower at the Basilica of Santa Croce. And the publication of his works would remain banned for nearly a century. Galileo's death made him a martyr for the cause of scientific thought. Galileo, the strife and struggle that he endured, plays an incredible role in, in our movie, a crucial, pivotal role. And it's all born out of something that we know to have been true the church's oppression of those that were looking beyond the rigid dogma of the day. But as suggested in Angels and Demons, did Galileo really become the inspiration for a series of deadly cults whose members will stop at nothing to avenge him? Radicals who are dedicated to the notion that science is the only true God? It's an ambigram. It's the same image, forward and backward. Now, that's common for a symbol like a yin and yang or a swastika, but that's a word. That Illuminati ambigrammatic symbol has been considered a myth for 400 years. In Angels and Demons, evidence suggests that the murderous attack on the Catholic Church is being perpetrated by an ancient secret society. Called the Illuminati, they are dedicated to the Church's total destruction. But did such a group exist? And if so, could they really have stayed undercover for more than 400 years? The Illuminati, the word itself, means to be illumined or enlightened. The Illuminati can be found in various types of secret societies, almost cults, in pagan religions, the Dionysian cult, for example, was a secret type of cult, and one had to be initiated into the mysteries. We find, even in Christian circles, Gnosticism as a type of Illuminati, meaning that one can really know the truth of the universe by being enlightened. 
So the Illuminati, which we find in Dan Brown's Angels and Demons, refers really to those who are enlightened with knowledge to know the secrets of the universe. According to Dan Brown's best-selling novel, the suppression and harsh treatment of Galileo by the church was the chief motivation for many scientists, intellectuals, and philosophers to form the Illuminati. It is even suggested that Galileo himself was a founding member. There were people who held progressive ideas, heterodox ideas, and so if you had progressive ideas, you could hold those ideas, you could speak to like-minded people, and this is what Galileo did. I mean, Galileo did belong to a very public group of scientists, the Academia de Linche. Did he belong to a sort of covert group, not a group with an identity? Ever since the dawn of the Middle Ages, there has been evidence of cults and secret societies that were established in an effort to promote science and reason. Those still willing to challenge the church were forced to gather in secret, providing safer environments in which to discuss radical and sometimes revolutionary ideas. One of the most powerful of these secret societies was the Rosicrucians. They were concerned with the reform of society, with the advancement of learning, particularly and specifically the areas of learning that the church frowned upon, such as scientific experiment and, of course, open debate. They were very much for democracy. And we are talking about very big names here. We're talking about Sir Isaac Newton. We're talking about Leonardo da Vinci. We're talking about Copernicus. They were all drawn to one form or another of Rosicrucianism. One very important element of Rosicrucian thinking is a kind of spiritual philosophy known as Hermeticism that was attributed to an Egyptian sage called Hermes Trismegistus. Hermeticism taught that human beings were essentially divine and that there were no limits to what an individual could do. Now this was completely the opposite to the view of humanity that the church put forward. In 1737, nearly one century after his death, the Catholic Church granted permission for Galileo's remains to be reburied. But as the body was being moved to a permanent crypt at the Basilica of Santa Croce, a scientist named Anton Gori secretly removed the middle finger of Galileo's right hand. The grisly relic would serve as an inspiration for future scientists and independent thinkers. It can still be seen today at the Institute and Museum of the History of Science in Florence, Italy. That ambigram, supposedly in the 16th century, some artist created it as a tribute to Galileo's love of symmetry. It was only going to be revealed when the Illuminati had amassed enough power to resurface and carry out their final goal. In Angels and Demons, it's the Illuminati that we're talking about. And conjecture plays a huge role when you start looking back at the Illuminati. And it also stimulates you to understand the, the known history around the purported conspiracy. Who are the Illuminati? Is there hard evidence that such a group actually existed? The Illuminati were founded in 1776 by Adam Weishaupt, who was a professor of natural and canon law at a Bavarian university. He initially called them the Order of the Perfectibilists. The idea was to make people perfect inside so that they can then have an influence on the outside world and improve the world. And that was his intent. It wasn't specifically a religious group. It was a secret society, but it had political motivations. Weishaupt was a militant atheist and also very influenced by Enlightenment ideas on politics. He was anti-monarchy and one might almost think almost uh, an anarchist. He didn't seem to believe in any sort of form of government and very anti-church. Weishaupt wanted to bring down the authority figures whether they were political or religious, to reform society in a way where everybody was equal. Now, these were revolutionary ideas for the day. They still are today. The Illuminati in Bavaria arose out of a horror at the repressiveness of the Catholic Church, which was extreme. They were not allowed to think for themselves, they were not allowed to meet and debate the issue. I mean, even if they were to voice their doubts 
about the right of the church to order people's lives. Their life would have been very short and very nasty. The struggle between the historical Illuminati and the Catholic Church is pretty much as Dan Brown portrays it in Angels and Demons. The Illuminati had a very specific anti-Catholic agenda. One of the things it wanted to do was break the power of the, the Catholic Church and the Jesuits in particular in Bavaria. When Weishaupt convinced a prominent diplomat named Baron Adolf Franz Friedrich Koniger to join the Illuminati in 1780, Illuminati membership skyrocketed from just a few hundred to nearly 2,000. It was obvious that the reform of these governments had become increasingly difficult, if not impossible. And so when the Illuminati make their appearance in Germany, it is remarkable the alacrity with which the authorities moved against them arrested as many of them as they thought they could locate, saw this as a conspiracy of kind of world proportions. When allegations and rumors about the Illuminati's so-called treasonous activities escalated, the Bavarian government ordered raids on the homes of suspected members. The raids produced a mountain of secret Illuminati documents, including the group's bylaws, a partial roster of its membership, tables revealing its secret symbols and various insignia, even details about the group's initiation ceremony. The government's response was swift and brutal. The organization was forbidden. Many of its members were arrested and imprisoned. Weishaupt himself had to uh, flee into exile. He was bound to come to the authorities' attention sooner or later. But it was very, very soon snuffed out. In 1784, the Duke of Bavaria, with the strong backing of the church, issued an edict that called for the execution of any individual caught recruiting for the Illuminati. Those allowing themselves to be recruited were stripped of all their possessions and condemned to permanent exile. The Illuminati was suppressed by the rulers of Bavaria. They stamped down on all secret societies. They saw them as being a dangerous thing, which in this case, if the Illuminati had succeeded in their aims, they would have brought down the governments and the states of Bavaria. So in some ways, it was a sensible thing to bring them down. The church, in order to maintain its status quo, we're going to bring down the Illuminati. When it comes down to protecting one's turf and maintaining the status quo, that's where it gets ugly. It's a very basic protagonist-antagonist dilemma. That's really important to the angels and demons. They've come for their revenge. Some experts insist that former members of the now disbanded Illuminati did survive underground. But if so, where did they go? Could they have infiltrated yet another and arguably more powerful secret organization? One equally shrouded in mystery? One perhaps right before our eyes? The Illuminati, they were dedicated to scientific truth, but the Vatican didn't like that. So the church began to, how did you say it? Oh, hunt them down and kill them. Drove them underground into a secret society. In the late 1700s, members of the Illuminati knew that in order to escape persecution from both the government and the Catholic Church, they must go even further underground. According to some scholars, there is evidence that surviving members found shelter inside a rival organization called the Freemasons. In fact, Illuminati founder Adam Weishaupt already counted himself a Freemason member, having joined just one year after forming the Illuminati. The strategy that the Illuminati adopted was to infiltrate Freemasonry. And the Illuminati reasoned that if they could take Freemasonry over, then they could use Freemasonry as a cover, as a means of recruiting new members. But if the Illuminati were to survive, why would they choose to join the Freemasons? Was there something about that particular organization that offered the perfect cover? Uh, Weishaupt's successors in the order clearly saw that Freemasonry was a, a first cousin 
some ideal for a new and higher wisdom hidden for centuries, suppressed not least by the church, which couldn't stand, it was thought, the reasonable, rational, enlightenment way of thought. Nobody knows for sure where Freemasonry came from. The first references in the historical record come in about the 1640s. But those references make it very clear that Freemasonry as a society or network of societies already existed, had existed for some time before that. We don't know how long before, uh, we don't know how it came into being. There are only theories. The mythology of Freemasonry claims that the first real Freemason was a master stonemason known as Hiram, and that he was working building the Temple of Solomon. And because of his influence with the king, a group of disloyal brothers came to resent him and murdered him. And hence you have the cult growing up around Hiram. And the Freemasons took as their symbol the Temple of Solomon based upon the architect of the early Jewish temple. The other major symbol in Freemasonry are the tools of stonemasonry, specifically a square and a compass, the types of things that you would use to measure a block, to build a perfect building. And these are the symbols of how to live a square life, if you will, a righteous life. Most historical records concerning the Freemasons indicate the society functioned as a guild during the early Middle Ages. Broken up into individual groups called lodges, it offered a way for skilled stonecutters and masonry workers to exchange and protect secret knowledge concerning their craft. In 1717, four lodges based in Great Britain banded together to form the first United Grand Lodge. It was then that the Catholic Church began to take notice. The Roman Catholic Church spied in Freemasonry a type of organization that it felt was dangerous because in the eyes of the church, Freemasonry imitated religious forms. It looked like a new religion. They said that, that all you had to do in order to belong to the lodges was to believe in God and to follow whatever religion happened to be the practice of the place you lived. At that time, deism was quite a belief amongst intellectuals. The idea of a creator god, a god who's out there somewhere, but who, having created the universe, then stepped back and let it carry on in its own way. And that's the basis of the, the god figure in Freemasonry. He's never referred to as god, but as the, the architect of the universe, he's the person who brought everything into being and created the form of the world that we live in. And you say all that, and then you go ahead and create rituals and passwords and handshakes and elaborate garments. Well, why do that? Some of the churches looked at that and said, this is some kind of new secular religion. In 1738, Pope Clement XII claimed that Masonic lodges were, in his words, spreading far and wide and growing daily in strength. He condemned the group and prohibited Catholics from engaging in Masonic activities. And particularly in Catholic countries, Freemasons were spied upon by the government. Portugal, some Freemasons were arrested and tortured by the Inquisition. So the authorities, particularly in Catholic Europe, took a very dim view of the lodges. But despite church efforts, the Freemasons continued to spread across Europe and the New World. And rumors of Illuminati influence and conspiracy began to take hold. They did take control of Freemasonry in Bavaria. This very neatly played into the hands of the Illuminati's opponents because they could start to say, Freemasonry and Illuminati are one and the same thing, so therefore the Illuminati still exist. But the Illuminati were infiltrators. There wasn't a powerful organization on Earth they didn't penetrate, including the Vatican, by hiding in plain sight. As you follow the Illuminati, well, some people think it leads to the Masons. Other people think it died out and was reborn two or three times. When you start talking about conspiracies from the past, you can 
you can just imagine so many diabolical twists and turns that have gone on that have never quite been recorded, reflecting what really does go on behind that veil of secrecy. This whole mythology about the Freemasons having conspiracies, uh, having secret powers, arose late in the 18th century under the impact of the French Revolution, when the opponents of the revolution argued that it had been the result of a conspiracy formed between the leaders of the Enlightenment and the Freemasons. A lot of people have seen the hand of Freemasonry behind uh, world events such as the American Revolution, you know, the building of its constitution and so on, the Declaration of Independence. Many of the people involved in that were Freemasons. Because of these ideals of equality, individual liberty, there's a, you know, a, a shared interest and a shared idealism behind both. Uh, the question that always arises from that is that, is this a band of conspirators who have chosen the cover of a Masonic Lodge, or is it a Masonic Lodge that has decided to go out and try and take, take over? In addition to George Washington, more than a dozen United States presidents have also been Freemasons, including Andrew Jackson, Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, and Gerald Ford. Some have even claimed that George Washington, working with Thomas Jefferson, an alleged member of the Illuminati, planned for the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., to be constructed in a symmetrical shape resembling a great Masonic power grid. Human beings' hidden agendas and the links that they're, they're willing to go in response to that agenda or to implement change is historically known. And the idea of being able to use either known or theorized conspiracies from the past as a foundation for modern mystery is really exciting stuff. But could there be other concealed evidence of Freemason and Illuminati influence? An influence that has been secretly shaping history for centuries? The path is alive. And if so, could the plot of angels and demons be closer to the truth than we think? What makes you so sure that the senior's there? The number 503. I kept seeing it over and over again in Illuminati letters, scribbled in the margin, sometimes just signed, 503. It's a numeric clue, but to what, five? Well, that's a meaningful number to the Illuminati. There's the pentagram, Pythagoras, dozens of other examples in science, but what about three? Didn't make sense until I thought, what if it's Roman numerals? D-I-I-I. D3, Galileo's third text, Dialogo. Discorso di Agrama. In the film Angels and Demons, renowned symbologist Robert Langdon must follow a trail of hidden symbols and clues in a race against the clock. Failure will result in the death of four prominent cardinals, the destruction of Vatican City, and irrevocable damage to the Roman Catholic Church. A symbologist knows that any symbol has multiple meanings depending on context and culture. If he's looking at a triangle in architecture, he knows it's the strongest structure there is to man. But if he's looking at it in a religious context, it's the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And yet that is also a very strong thing. But just how real are the symbols suggested in the story? Is the world we live in really riddled with secret messages and clues which signify the struggle between science and faith? All secret societies um, have to employ codes and symbols, even just for reasons of security, so that you can recognize other members and that you can pass information between members without others knowing. With those secret societies that have a more kind of spiritual or esoteric side, symbols speak to the unconscious in a way that simple words don't. You know, they're much more evocative. Um, you know, pyramids, you know, all-seeing eyes, they just speak to the unconscious. The symbol of the all-seeing eye 
has been associated with Freemasonry and the Illuminati for centuries. It can even be found on the back of the American $1 bill. A lot of people regard this eye in the triangle symbol as the symbol of the Illuminati. But in fact, it began in the Middle Ages. It was a symbol for divine or for God's omnipresence. It was God's all-seeing eye that he can see everywhere. He's always watching. But why would this symbol, long associated with the Freemasons, be so prominently displayed on the currency of the United States? Some historians suggest that Vice President Henry Wallace, a high-ranking Freemason, convinced fellow Lodge member Franklin Roosevelt to use the great seal design on the dollar bill. This is one of the oldest stories that we can associate with Masonic mythology. There is no concrete evidence that the eye on the back of the dollar bill is specifically a Masonic symbol. The problem is that that particular eye turns up in so many different books and pamphlets in the course of the 18th century, both Masonic and completely non-Masonic. It was such a commonplace. In the first instance, it was meant to be a symbol of God. And so it's very difficult to say that it comes specifically out of Freemasonry. Yet according to Dan Brown's own research for his book, Angels and Demons, the all-seeing eye above the pyramid is an Illuminati symbol called the Shining Delta. The eye allegedly signifies the Illuminati's all-seeing infiltration of powerful organizations around the world. Brown asserts that the delta, or triangle around the eye, is the mathematical symbol for change and represents the group's intention of bringing about a secular new world order. The rays of light emanating from the triangle signify enlightenment or Illuminati. One of the appeals of cryptology, which has brought out angels and demons very well, is that you're kind of in a group which is separate from the outside world because only you know the secret. And then there are the outsiders who are trying to break in. The very earliest forms of codes and ciphers are found in the Egyptian hieroglyphics. And then later on, as people began to write in alphabetical languages, alphabetical writing, people began to use writing to conceal military messages. Julius Caesar, for example, used a very simple code to conceal his messages. Others used other kind of simple codes. And it has always been in use in military forms since the very earliest days. In the 13th century, the English monk and scientist Roger Bacon sketched out seven cipher methods, some of which were ultimately adopted by clandestine groups such as the Illuminati. Roger Bacon was a monk in about the 1200s. And in a study of all forms of knowledge, he wrote a few paragraphs dealing with secret writing. He explained different kinds of cipher systems that might be used. Included among the cipher methods described by Bacon is a complex system of anagrams in which letters were rearranged to disguise a document's true meaning. This latter method was eventually employed by a number of prominent scientists who wished to keep their discoveries secret from rival scientists or from the Catholic Church. Sometimes during the Enlightenment, people would use cryptograms to conceal individual discoveries. For example, Galileo used a cryptogram to encipher the fact that he had discovered some gravitational force or about the motion of planets around the sun. Ironically, just as scientists and other secular thinkers use symbols and puzzles to evade detection by the all-powerful Catholic Church, the Church itself used symbols in an effort to communicate complex religious ideas, or in some cases, co-opt pre-Catholic or pagan ideology. We 
will destroy your four pillars. We will brand your preferred. Wait, stop it. Stop. Sacrifice. Brand them. That's another Illuminati legend. This one says that there are a set of five brands, each one an ambigram. The first four are the fundamental elements of science, earth, air, fire, and water. When four of the church's cardinals are abducted in modern-day Rome, they are gruesomely branded with clues in the form of ambigrams. Popularized by famed artist and calligrapher John Langdon, ambigrams are words fashioned in such a way that they read exactly the same either upside down or forwards and backwards. Interestingly, it was Langdon's gift for symbols and wordplay that directly inspired author Dan Brown to name his protagonist Robert Langdon. In Angels and Demons, there are various groups of people who are using codes to uh, to communicate secretly about nefarious deeds like doing bad things, assassinating people. People are interested in secrets. They want to find out what they are. And codes, which are a method of communicating secrets, play a significant role in people's lives, whether they know it or not. Perhaps they just whisper instead of talking out loud. And this, it seems to me, is the appeal of codes and of books like Angels and Demons. In Angels and Demons, there's a great deal to this understanding of symbols and what they've meant uh, throughout history and what they could mean in the future. But words and symbols aren't the only means by which secrets can be hidden or clues can be given. The unknown Illuminati master? Some covert and subversive messages can be hiding right in plain sight. I need access to the Vatican archives. <laughs> Professor, I don't think this is the appropriate moment. Your petition has been denied seven times. No, no, this, this, ha this has nothing to do with my work. The path of illumination is a hidden trail through Rome itself that leads to the Church of the Illumination, the place where the Illuminati would meet in secret. If I can find the senyo, the sign that marks the beginning of that path, the four churches along it may be where he intends to murder your cardinals. In his race against time, Robert Langdon must decipher a series of elaborate and hidden clues in order to find four kidnapped cardinals and a time bomb set to destroy the Vatican. Some are word clues in the form of riddles, poems, and cryptograms. But others are more geographical and contain codes and symbols embedded in architecture, sculptures, and paintings, each found along the so-called path of illumination once used by the Illuminati to test new members. But is there any truth in the notion that Rome and the Vatican is riddled with such clues? And that these clues were supposedly planted by the city's most famous architect and according to Angels and Demons, secret Illuminati member, John Lorenzo Bernini. The chapel is Raphael, but the sculptures are Bernini. The unknown Illuminati master, Bernini. Born in Naples in the year 1598, Bernini was the son of a sculptor. He went to work as his father's assistant when he was only seven years old. And by the time he reached adolescence, was producing his own commissioned artworks. Bernini was the perfect image maker for the 17th century. He himself was of a very passionate and creative and artistic nature, much like any youth. He was particularly famous for his tempestuous affairs and his violent temper. At one point, Bernini suspected that his mistress, Constanza Bonarelli, was having an affair with his own brother. The sculptor confronted his brother at sword point and ordered an assistant to slash Constanza's face with a razor. The Pope, who was his friend, had to personally intercede and say, look, this is getting out of hand quite radically. Bernini became a much more devoted person. So from that point on, he's able to combine a love of his Catholic faith with a great appreciation of the pagan past, which in some ways are quite incompatible. A 
According to Angels and Demons, Bernini designed four altars of science along the path and strategically placed them to form the points of a cross. Each one represented one of the four major scientific elements, earth, air, fire, and water. Earth, wind, fire, water, these are the essence of what makes up, you know, our world. And these have been worshipped or used in worship since the beginning of uh, pagan religion, essentially worship of nature. Bernini makes sculpture out of earth, air, fire, and water. It is the very stuff of artistic creation. You might argue that making sculpture is an alchemical magic, and that the stuff of his magic is those basic elements. The earth site is in the Chigi Chapel of Santa Maria del Popolo. When Akiji became Pope, he commissioned Bernini to finish the chapel, which he did, putting four astonishing sculptures in it, including the sculpture of Habakkuk and the angel. The earth symbolism in the Kiji Chapel is the burials of the Kiji family, which are placed under the actual chapel in the earth, under what Dan Brown calls a demon's hole, which is just a disc placed on the ground so that you can open it up and go down to the burials below. This is the first marker. The path is alive. The outstretched arms of the angel in Bernini's Habakkuk sculpture takes a frantic Robert Langdon southwest to St. Peter's Square. With only four hours left before the antimatter bomb might destroy the Vatican, he finds the second altar, this one inspired by the wind. Covering an area of nearly six acres and capable of holding up to 8,000 people, St. Peter's Square is one of the artist's greatest architectural achievements. In front of St. Peter's, he honored all the directions and the winds that blow through the planet. In the plaza, Bernini has marked the four cardinal directions with symbols. And the symbol for the west is a disc on the floor of the plaza with an angel's face on it. And the angel has beautiful flowing hair and is blowing like the west wind. And that image of the west wind is seen as being the good wind, but especially the idea of that is the wind that comes from the interior of the church and brushes out to the populace into that square. As Langdon races to find the third altar, he heads east along the Tiber River to the church of Santa Maria della Vittoria. Here, the element of fire can be found in one of Bernini's most acclaimed sculptures. It is a depiction of the ecstasy of Santa Teresa of Avila, the Spanish saint who at age 50 had a vision of the love of God appearing to her as a beautiful young angel who took the flaming arrow of the love of God and pierced her body. It's a very fair thing to say that Dan Brown would connect the element of fire to the representation of the ecstasy of St. Teresa because the agent of God in that is an angel, but not just any angel. This is a seraph. Seraphim, uh, shown, they're often shown as being multi-winged, are aflame with God's love. With time running out, Robert Langdon races to the final point on the so-called path of illumination. Searching for a location that represents the element water, he finds the fountain of the four rivers located at the Piazza Navona. And on each one of these platforms, Bernini and his assistants carved a statue that would represent one of the four main rivers of the world. The four rivers are the Ganges to represent Asia, the Nile to represent Africa, the Danube for Europe, and for the newly discovered American continents, the Rio de la Plata. In an age of discovery, this fountain was emblematic of the new worlds that were being discovered every day. 
sense. Each of these allegorical figures flows with water to fill the fountain. And between them, in the center of those four monumental, gigantic figures, is an immense obelisk rising above it. A lot of the works of art that feature in Angels and Demons, the ones associated with Bernini, supposedly the, uh, the Illuminati master, feature Egyptian symbolism. The question is, why should there be such a vote at that time for Egyptian symbols, for pyramids, obelisks, hieroglyphs, all those things? Because you wouldn't expect it, because Egyptian symbols were actually employed by the Rosicrucians. So it's actually the last thing you'd expect the Vatican and the Pope to want to spread around Rome at that period. Look, 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 right in front of the church, an obelisk, a lofty pyramid, Egyptian symbol adopted by the Illuminati. In fact, Egyptian obelisks can be seen throughout the city and are prominently placed at many points along the path of illumination. So here, we have the pagan symbol, the obelisk, placed in front of St. Peter's. And above that pagan symbol at the very top is what? A cross. And the cross casts its shadow, casts its light, casts its rays, 360 degrees around that obelisk. The Romans conquer the Egyptians, and they take those obelisks and they re-erect them, showing how the Christian civilization has triumphed over these long-gone, long-dead civilizations. There it is. When you get to the one in the Piazza Navona, you have also the dove with the olive branch. Well, the then pope who commissioned this work from Bernini is a Pamphili. The Pamphili Palace is right there in Piazza Navona, and the Pamphili symbol was the dove, with the olive branch. So it's this pope covers the world under the light of Christ. Almost every part of the city, whether you're following an Illuminati map or not, you're going to be running into things that Bernini did that changed the city. He transformed the city as a sculptor, as an architect, and as a city planner. There are, I think, symbols in his art because symbolism is simply a kind of visual language, which I think was more important in the time period that we're looking at in the 17th century and earlier because still a large portion of the population could not read and could not write. Bernini would spend the rest of his life working on styles of architecture and works of art that would allow us to glimpse a magical supernatural world beyond. Constructing a series of piazzas and roads and paths throughout the city to draw the pilgrim from one part of the city, the ancient part of the city, towards the newer part of the city. And Bernini became the great set designer of the world's most beautiful theater, the city of Rome. But does all this blending of Christian and pagan imagery in Bernini's designs really betray him as a secret enemy of the Vatican? And if so, can all of the striking symbols evident in his art and architecture really be joined together into some grand design? A design that conceals one of the most elaborate diabolical puzzles ever conceived? Some unknown Illuminati master sculpted four statues, each one a tribute to one of the fundamental elements, earth, air, fire, water, and placed the statues out in public in churches throughout Rome. Each statue held a clue pointing to the next. At the end of the path was the Church of Illumination. If you could find that, you were one of them. In Angels and Demons, the final destination on the path of illumination is an imposing fortress that has stood guard over Rome for more than 2,000 years. It is the Castel Sant'Angelo, or the Castle of the Angel, located less than a half mile from the Vatican. In both the novel and the film, it is portrayed as the secret headquarters of the ancient Illuminati order, a hiding place supposedly used again and again over the centuries, where they would gather close to the heart of their mortal enemy the Catholic Church, and wait for just the right time to strike. But are their secrets really hidden behind these walls? 
And what significance does the castle really have to the Vatican? This building today, known as the Castel Sant'Angelo, is a very interesting symbol of Rome's fascination with life and death and life again. Because this building started out its existence almost 2,000 years ago as a monumental tomb. This is the site where the Emperor Hadrian was buried upon his death in 137. The first transformation of this building took place during the Great Plague of Rome in 590 AD. The Archangel Michael appeared with his flaming sword aloft and resheathing it before the eyes of the assembled, the plague ended. And so from that moment on, the building was connected with Christianity. During the 14th century, the Catholic Church took full control of the castle, but for reasons that were more practical than religious. Because of the constant state of warfare that persisted throughout the Middle Ages, the tomb was transformed into a fortress to protect the papal elite. It was used as a fortress because it's a huge, massive masonry that is very easily defended. And it's a great place to take, to, to take refuge. It was also used as the papal treasury. So it was also a papal prison. So it's um, a multi-purpose building that is uh, impressive and impregnable. During the course of the 15th century, the popes added moats, they put in bastions, they added places for cannons, turning this into the site where he who controlled Castel Sant'Angelo would be he who controlled Rome. During the papacy of Pope Nicholas III, an elevated passageway was constructed. Called the Passetto de Borgio, it connected the Vatican directly to the castle and offered a convenient escape route in times of trouble. When the construction of the Castel Sant'Angelo into a fortress took place, the Passetto was linked up to the Castel Sant'Angelo on this side and then stretched all the way back to the Papal Palace, the apartments of the Pope on the other side. It's a passageway, a safe passage for the Pope's, if you will, to escape to the castle in time of need. I mean, it's a very fortressed wall, and you can see it from the outside, and it has kind of slats in the middle, so you could peek out and uh, have a look at where the enemy was. On May 6, 1527, 16,000 mercenary soldiers from Germany broke through the city walls and came swarming into St. Peter's Square. Their aim was to hang Pope Clement VII with a golden noose. And Pope Clement VII was taken along the Passetto. He was taken into the Castel Sant'Angelo and protected. But the Swiss guards who smuggled him out onto that passageway gave their lives for this. 147 of his 200 guard died in that day. But to enemies of the church, Castel Sant'Angelo represents more than a protective hideout for the papacy. It is, at times, regarded as a place of persecution. One of the most colorful characters in the papacy, Pope Alexander VI, was the one who created the deepest and most profound prisons within the Castel Sant'Angelo to hide away many of his enemies to never be seen again. And those dark spaces, which can still be visited today, these deep prisons buried in the body of, the, of this enormous structure, begin to give the idea of a labyrinth or a lair. So between Hadrian's concentric circles as you move towards the core of this building and these dark, dank prison cells constructed by Alexander VI, the Castel Sant'Angelo lends itself to mystery and to, to excitement and to storytelling. At the other end of Il Passetto lies the Vatican. Arguably more mysterious, forbidden, and rich with history than any other place on Earth. I mean, the Vatican is built on an ancient burial ground. And of course, for the Catholic Church, what's important about that place is that they say St. Peter was buried there. So when you go into the catacombs, it's a very dark, cavernous kind of place. And you see um, the Roman mausoleums to the old Roman families. And then you go up the stairs, and you see the place where St. Peter's bones are said to be. 
The second tier where the popes are buried is open to the public. The catacombs underneath, you have to make a special appointment to go see. The Illuminati called those four churches by the special name, L'Altare de la Scienza. Sacrifice them on the altars of science, he said. Exactly. Oh, wow. Look at this. Another area within the Vatican is so mysterious that its very name conjures an air of the forbidden. The Vatican Secret Archives. It is here, in both the book and the film versions of Angels and Demons, that Robert Langdon finds clues that he hopes will help him solve the mystery. The chambers are hermetic vaults. Oxygen is kept at lowest possible levels. There's a partial vacuum inside. So extended stays are not recommended. I'll be just outside the door, watching you, Mr. Langdon. But what is actually housed within the secret archives of the Vatican? And why would access to its 52 miles of shelves be so restricted by the Roman Catholic Church? The Vatican archives are quite simply the collection of all the historical documents that exist since the first centuries, really, of Christianity. And they are open to scholars. You can petition the Vatican and go and study the archives. There are many people who say that the Vatican doesn't allow complete access to all of the documents that are in there. Some of the archives are simply not organized uh, for use by the qualified public. And I think all of the Vatican archives have the 100-year rule. That is to say, they are not open to the public uh, for, until 100 years has passed from the date to protect the reputation of people who are involved in this sometimes confidential correspondence. What we do in pastoral care of people, oftentimes, whether it's on a very small scale, one-on-one, -on -one, like inside the confessional, or on a large scale, does need to be confidential to protect the people that have shared some of the most intimate secrets. So that in and of itself is gonna kind of breed conspiracy theories because there's secrecy. But those sort of things kind of magnify is there secrecy about that church. And really, honestly, to, in today's world, secrecy is a dirty word. Secrets, forbidden knowledge, and a conspiracy that targets the Catholic Church. But is Dan Brown's Angels and Demons merely a work of fiction? Or are there broader implications? Clues that lead us, not only through the ancient streets of the Vatican, but very much closer to home. I'm quite familiar with incendiaries, Miss Vetra. I've never heard of antimatter being used as such. Well, it's never been generated in significant quantities before. It's a way of studying the origins of the universe to try to isolate what some people call the God particle. But there are implications for energy the research. God particle? What we call it isn't important. It's what gives all matter mass, the thing without which we could not exist. You're talking about the moment of creation. Yes. In Angels and Demons, the assassin steals a small quantity of highly volatile antimatter from the laboratory at CERN in order to trigger the destruction of the Vatican and the entire hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. But why antimatter? And how does it relate to the centuries-old struggle between science and religion? Our church is at war. In Switzerland, at the European Organization for Nuclear Research, known as CERN, the laboratory's most ambitious experiment involves the Large Hadron Collider, a 17-mile-long device that allows scientists to create high-speed antimatter collisions. It is hoped that study of these collisions might someday reveal the holy grail of particle physics, the Higgs boson particle, otherwise known as the God particle. Although not as yet proven, the Higgs boson is theoretically the particle that could help to prove what has become known as the Big Bang Theory, the means by which the entire universe might have been created. The term God particle is one that I have a love-hate relationship with in that 
I think it certainly captures the imagination of people who don't work in the field, but it really was to get across the idea of it being a particle that imparts properties to a large number of other particles, essentially all of the other particles in physics. This idea of a God particle in the universe, there's this tendency to want to find a physical proof of God's existence. And so we're looking for something in the material universe that might indeed prove, yes, a God exists. But in my view, this search for a God particle is very untheological because it dispels faith. Faith, by its very nature, is an assent to what cannot be proved, what cannot be seen. That is, you might say, the strength of faith itself. And so it should not be taken that God particle means that if we find it, we understand everything. In fact, uh, there's, a, there's a huge amount more to be understood. Do you believe in God, sir? Faith is a gift that I have yet to receive. In 1978, Pope John Paul II was elected head of the Roman Catholic Church. The forward-thinking pope re-examined sensitive issues that had embroiled the Vatican in controversy for centuries. Pope John Paul asked the Pontifical Academy to look into the Galileo case, and in the year 2000, he makes a public apology for a series of ills that the institutional church had committed in, in centuries past. And so amongst these is an apology to Galileo. Pope John Paul II asked, as kind of a, a, an olive branch to the scientific community, let's reopen that case and look into the errors that we've already admitted were wrong, and yet re-examine that and discover why that happens, so that, in his words, we can find a greater concord between science and faith. In 2005, Pope Benedict XVI was elected as the 265th Bishop of Rome, in a line that has remained unbroken since the time of St. Peter. Ironically, this pontiff was born in Germany, the very birthplace of the Illuminati. Certainly today, I think you see a Vatican that is much more willing to consider the changes in the new technology and try to incorporate that into their worldview. In fact, to the point that there's actually a papal observatory um, and the Vatican takes really uh, you know, seriously, the uh, results that come out of science. So on topics like stem cell research, on topics like cloning, on topics like euthanasia, um, there is much more discussion today. There, there was a time when it would have just been a straight no. Now I think that the Vatican is very interested in at least hearing about what are the limits of science, what are the possibilities in this direction. In some ways, religion and science are seeking answers to the same questions. Who are we? Where did we come from? And where, perhaps, are we going? I think that the big challenges are not going to be coming from specific technologies, you know, biotechnology questions, but the general theoretical issue of reconciling faith and science. When you start thinking about the tensions between science and religion, where this tension comes from, I think, is at times when religion or science forgets a little bit what it's good at and loses a little bit of its humility and becomes a bit arrogant. Not every question has an answer that can be answered experimentally with a measurement or a test. And those really aren't questions for science to explore. That's for other areas of human knowledge and human inquiry. Thomas Aquinas said it is both faith and reason. It's the confluence of those two that allows us knowledge of truth and really getting to know God. He said that they don't compete and they will never conflict, he said, that we need both science and faith, faith and reason together. Science and religion are not enemies. There are simply some things that science is just too young to understand. So the church pleads, stop, slow down, think, wait. In Angels and Demons, you've got essentially Big Bang theorists and creationist theorists. You've got science versus faith. You've got CERN versus the Vatican. There is no yes or no to Angels and Demons, and that's what I like about it. It doesn't take an editorial position that one is proven and one is disproven. If the outside world could see this church as I do, looking beyond the ritual of these walls, 
they would see a, a modern miracle, a brotherhood of imperfect, simple souls. Spartacus at 99% the speed of light. It's a story of science versus religion. And that's a subject that, of controversy that will never get solved. And so it's, it's a stirring conversation. Who is more ignorant? The man who cannot define lightning or the man who does not respect its natural awesome power? Photons are moving. Dan Brown in Angels and Demons dramatizes that whole great debate between science and religion. They were dedicated to scientific truth. So the church began to, how did you say it? Oh, hunt them down and kill them. We like to believe that the Vatican has all these conspiracy theories and that it's got a great secrecy hidden in its archives. What makes you so sure that the senor's there? The number 503. There may be an element of that. Every institution has its secrets. Dan Brown certainly is a master craftsman of combining things that are factually accurate and historically true with fiction. An obelisk, Egyptian symbol adopted by the Illuminati. But when you've got something where someone can take out of their pocket a dollar bill and see this pyramid that he's talking about, then they begin to wonder, does that mean everything in the book is true? Does that mean we really have all these kind of conspiracies and secret societies? The best response I can think of to reading Angels and Demons is saying, I'm gonna get on a plane and go to Rome and see the places, see those works of art, see the Vatican, see it for myself. What is so unusual about the entertainments that Dan Brown creates is that they're controversial, they're thought-provoking. They stimulate the imagination, they stimulate curiosity. The path of illumination is a hidden trail through Rome itself. They lead us to educate ourselves. There it is, the angel of peace. And human beings, we all love a mystery. Break this conclave. Open the doors. Hey! And tell the world the truth.